teams that does take you know you know typical microsoft product um yeah recording has started uh, the floor is yours jenny uh okay so let me get started so hopefully hopefully you can all you can all uh, see my screen please shout if you can't um so just wanted to start by welcoming everybody here today and there's uh, so nice to see lovely faces people i've worked with uh for years and that's really nice so we've got product folks in the room testing folks um BAs, uh, all sorts of all sorts of different uh, folks here come to listen to, to this about the power of Oopsie. And if you don't know me already, uh, I'm basically about, all about things uh, collaboration. So that could be, you know, from product and agile development stuff through to anything really that helps teams reach their potential. So even kind of team stuff and stuff about psychology and uh, human motivation really kind of gets me interested. So um, I feel kind of really uh, motivated when you get that feeling of all the collective intelligence in the room, the whole team pulling, pulling along, uh, doing awesome things together with um, with lots of smiley faces. And I want to be kind of part of that. So what's Oopsie all about then? Well, this is uh, something that came, something that came together. Um, about six or seven years ago, based on some patterns and practices that that we were using at the time. And this is a shout out to, to Chris and Pete, who are actually on the call. Uh, we we were really lucky at that time. We working in a super small team, we were able to develop all these new practices and really just work in, in whatever way um, suited us. And, um, you know, Chris and Pete both got great brains for bouncing ideas around. And this is something that popped out of that. And back then I talked about it quite a lot. Pete and I did some talks on it as well. And then I got really busy, um, been consulting for quite a few years. And then recently been a bit surprised that people are using it. And I've heard people using it. My blog that I did ages ago, which is out of date, keeps getting pingbacks and stuff. Uh, and then I heard from from JJ um, that he's been rolling it out in big organisations and, you know, people are getting benefit from it. So I thought, right, well, I should probably get back out there and, and talk about it a bit more. So um, this came from some frustrations with um, with Agile, I guess, the Agile practices and ways of working. You might be familiar with some of this. So, um how long has that job been around? Anyone want to unmute and chat? 20 years or so. 20 years. 20 years. 20 years. I know 20 years. How can that be? That's that makes me feel really, really old. It's a bit like, you know, when somebody says to me, oh, you know, in the 80s or whatever, and I think, yeah, that's, you know, 20 years ago. And then you think, Christ, that's actually 42 years ago. Getting old, so yeah, it's been up. It's been around for twenty years now, um, and you know, there's big differences from how things to be used to be before agile. And this is one of the problems that I see, and it was true ten years ago. It's still true now with teams that I work with, uh, and this is just struggles working with with these small autonomous chunks of work, user stories mostly, and. User stories can be great because they help us break things down. They um, encourage collaboration. They're designed to help us deliver small chunks of value early. Um, but there can also be problems with them, right? Because you can you can have this massive festering backlog of tickets, which I still see. And when team members are dealing with user stories and taking them off a list, sometimes they've sort of lost sight of the big picture and they don't really know how things are relating to each other. So I don't know if you can associate that, but I certainly see that really regularly. Um, another problem is that, you know, these, these, little, these little tickets, these little stories, we're encouraged not to capture too much detail because we want to be lightweight, we want to be nimble, we want to go have a conversation. Um, but when you start working with them, you realise that actually they're way more complicated than you thought. Um, and so you suddenly need to write loads more stories to capture the detail or or just kind of 
blunder on with maybe not enough information, which leads to re rework or the iteration be derailed or and also um, teams can often get into this thing where they just write loads and loads of stories up front and then they're in the exact same position as they would have been in the waterfall days doing all this upfront analysis only they're just kind of typing them all into a massive list in JIRA rather than catching them in, you know, in a do big document. So that's kind of the second key thing that I see. And the third one is just this uh, difficulty finding the value. So this is something that, you know, talking about even 15 years ago, um, when we when we think about agile, we often think about Scrum and Jira and continuous integration environments, microservices architecture, you know, all the ceremonies that go with those methodologies. Um, but even organisations that have been using Agile for ages are, are still struggling to have conversations about where the next bit of value is or, you know, how to break down a big problem into smaller chunks. Um, where where the chunks are meaningful and where value can be demonstrated. And that's really hard. Um, and so uh, team members are often still building components of a, of a system kind of in isolation from each other. Uh, so I think it's easier to notice this, actually, if you've had experience with the pre-agile time, you know, if you've got the got the wrinkles. And, I, and some of the teams I'm working with now, they don't know anything else. They've only ever experienced working with stories and working with Scrum. And so I'm just going to kind of take you back a little bit to some of the, the, the features of working in a waterfall way, just so that we can reflect on what's actually happened as we've moved to agile practices. So we all know waterfall. Well, most people, I, I talked about this last week with the team and a few of them didn't hadn't heard of it, which really surprised me. But the thing about water, waterfall, you know, it's bad, right? Because there's a giant great timeline where all of the features get analysed up front. And there's these handovers between the disciplines and during each of those handovers. There's lots of opportunity for misunderstanding. And it's difficult to, to start small because business um, stakeholders are trying to get all of their requirements in. And so there's lots of wastage. You know, we get to the end two years later, the world's changed. So we know we know the bad side of this. Um, but there was a structure to it, right? There was a, there was a structure to it. You kind of knew where you were with it. Um, and this brings me to the V model. As, Anybody old enough to have heard of the V model? This would be the testing, testing experts. I can hear everybody. I can't see you. You're enough to shout. Yeah, absolutely. It was, then, it was really exciting then, done that. the first time you come across it. Yeah. Yeah. They've been there, done that. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about the V model. OK, so the V model was sort of a, a more progressive version of Waterfall where we still had these upfront activities on the left right so start with the high level requirements gets handed over from a business analyst maybe to a systems analyst who's going to turn that 20 page document into seven eight hundred pages of functional specification you know loads of misunderstandings in there or gaps or whatever hand that over to somebody else who's maybe a designer so they're going to relearn it, redigest it, maybe create eight or nine design documents, some architecture documents, some logical architecture, some physical architecture. Hand that on to somebody else who's going to um, do the detailed design, maybe distributed against some engineering leads, some tech leads, and then you've got the code. All right, this is my clicks aren't working yet. Then you get the code. So that's the that's the kind of waterfall part. Then the V model recognised that for each of those sort of decompositions, those levels of elaboration, there was an appropriate sort of type of testing that you would do. So your high level requirements would inform the user acceptance tests and the functional specification would inform the system tests and the high level design component tests, <clears throat> detailed design unit tests, etc. 
And we realise uh, that there might be some value in trying to bring the, the UAT team closer to the requirements, trying to bring the systems tester closer to the, uh, the folks writing the functional spec, etc. to try and collaborate more and, you know, reduce those misunderstandings. So we were trying to do that. But the important thing about this um, is that we're recognising these different sorts of testing that we're doing and we're recognising that there's different layers of detail and elaboration that are helping inform that. Um, whereas in the agile world, if you're just dealing with a bunch of stories, that's not apparent at all. Uh, and so what I see are teams who are writing stories or tests or given when thens or all sorts of producing all sorts of artifacts, but they don't really know what level of detail they're working at and they don't know who they're for, um, which can be quite problematic. And this slide, so Pete, be really familiar with this. I must have shown this slide in almost every uh, Agile talk I've ever done. Um, and this is this, this kind of recognition of these processes of um, analysis and synthesis. So analy analysis, uh, literally a, a word that means to break down. OK, and so when we analyse things, we decompose them, we deconstruct them and we examine them. Uh, and that might represent, you know, a requirements document breaking down into a functional specification. But as we would do that kind of analysis, there's also other stuff going on where you're wrestling with complexity and you're moving between the problem and the solution space and you're making decisions about how things should fit together to form a new solution. And then you do this sort of synthesis of all of those ideas and it becomes something concrete, which might be a, a specification. So if we see, if we think about this in terms of our software development process, you know, we start with some requirements in the agile world, they might look a bit like user stories and we go through this process and end up with something which is a target for development. Now, this used to be uh, an easy process to notice during the olden days because of that structured waterfall and all those documents, you know, you'd know that a functional specification was a specification. So it used to take weeks to put that stuff together. There are loads of thinking going on to do this analysis and synthesis. You know, it's at the point that something becomes a specification that it becomes synthesized. Uh, and this is really difficult to figure out now because what we often try and do is track this thing called a user story all the way through this process. And for years, I was trying to, um, my brain wanted there to be a really nice sort of extrapolation of this requirement as a user story through to some kind of nice example or something sitting the other end. And what, what I came to realise is that it just doesn't work like that. You know, these things, it's not a linear line. There's a kind of munge that goes on in the middle, uh, which is super difficult if all of your conversations, all of your requirements and your specifications um, are sitting in JIRA. It's really difficult to, to know that. And it's really difficult to know when you're going through this process if you're working with stories. And so if we think about they start off as a requirement, but then they get oh, split sorry, out. They get... Um, uh, I need to run. There's some Use some storm. Can somebody mute? We've got a conversation going on. Okay, thank you. Um, so we wrestle with them, and at some point in that wrestling, this this user story, which started off as a requirement, turns into something that looks like a specification, and that's probably the acceptance criteria. Or if you're working with BDD, um, the examples. And the other note, the other thing to notice about that, um, and Pete and me and Chris used to talk about this years ago as well, is that this user story thing is transient, yeah? Whereas this specification thing is enduring. Normally by the time you get to this bit, you're um, describing the behaviour of your application and what's expected. And if that's based on the rules of the application, that's going to be pretty long lived. So you want to keep that. 
which causes all sorts of problems with teams when they're trying to you know balance the amount of documentation that they're trying to capture versus um you know the tools that they've got and these little post-it notes and all things it makes it difficult so this sends it sends a bit of a shiver through me uh, functional decomposition this is one of the first analysis techniques that I learned whilst on a boot camp for Perot systems in Dallas in 1998. Um, and this is the functional decomposition. So this is a bit how our functional spec used to be structured. OK, so, you know, let's imagine that our functional spec is describing a coupon management system, which is the business that Pete and Chris and I used to be in. And it was broken down by these big chunks, you know, setting up and uh, a setup and reporting portal, coupon issuance, coupon redemption, coupon clearing. And that would be kind of four big sections in the document. And then sitting under there, sitting under coupon issuance, there might be some key components or key sort of um, use cases, coupon at till, digital coupons, load to card. And then sitting under coupon at till, there'd be uh, some more different um, uses and then sitting under there there'd be some uh, interactions or some um, scenarios to support that and whilst there was loads of issues with this right I mean heaven knows there's here's our 90 987 page document but if you're on page 600 or whatever and you're on section I'm looking at this section 2.1.1 one a basket evaluation um you could look back through the document and see how they were related to each other but also in the document you'd have different diagrams and representations that helped you understand at that level so you'd have stuff at the top orange level that helped you understand the key components of the solution you'd have stuff you know, you might have some interaction diagrams, you might have um, some sequence diagrams and they'd all be nested. And so so you could understand the thought process and how things related to each other. Uh, there were loads of other problems with it, though, right? You know, who can possibly review uh, a 900 page document? I remember we used to um, raise bugs against against uh, things that went wrong in testing. And if we were on the test team, we'd say, oh, that's been raised as a bug. We'd go back to the requirement specification. We'd say, no, no, that's as designed. And we'd talk to the users and say, no, 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 I, I think you'll find on page 656, it's specified, and you signed it off. Um, but how could they possibly with that sort of volume of, of information in, in one place? So bad things about it, but some sort of usefulness in, in that structure. So we still need to break things down, right? But there's a major difference between the breaking down of the olden days stuff, like this function de functional decomposition, versus how we work now. Um, and the main difference is that when we're working in an agile way, we're breaking down value rather than functionality. It's a totally different concept. And when we're breaking down value, it's much more like a navigation. It's much more like a map where your your whole kind of calling is to navigate the map to find the, the place in the map where you can deliver the value earlier. So in this example of this functional decomposition, there might be a super valuable bit on page 230 but you have to deliver the whole load in, in one big bang in order to get that value. Um, and that's really hard, you know, actually thinking about how we balance all of those things. Um, so we've got these sort of, you know, we might create these sort of value waypoints where we're understanding our, our strategy to get to the whole lot of value in sort of increments of value. And we're navigating like it's a map. So we're going to invest in understanding our destination. The team, we're going to try and act like an expert sat nav team so we're going to know uh, loads about where we're trying to get to and what that looks like and we're going to know loads about the the value steps incrementally to get there but you know if we turn into a road and find out that there's been a, a landslip or something or or the the road's blocked or uh, even if the car runs out of petrol we might get the train right so we're gonna we're gonna 
find a, find a different way to get to that destination and try and keep the details about how we're going to get there quite light until the until the last sort of responsible moment. So this is quite hard uh, for teams to grasp this kind of idea of um, doing enough thinking, uh, sort of navigating to value, um, but you're not doing it in that waterfall way, which used to be easy. You're doing it in this sort of iterative way. And there's lots of different heartbeats of, of iteration that are happening around us, which makes it hard to visualise. Um, so anybody heard of the game Asteroids? Just wave at me if you have. Hopefully I can see you. There's a really nice analogy in Jeff Patton, who wrote story mapping in his book about how we break things down. I don't think it was his analogy, but he, he liked it too. And I really liked it. I think it really helps make sense of how we're trying to do this uh, navigation. So if you think about asteroids kind of going all these references to the 80s, going back to the 80s. Um, you would be this little this little uh, spaceship. And your, your goal is to try and blow up the asteroid and get rid of every single fragment of the asteroid on the screen. Um, and then you get to the next level. Uh, as you blow up the asteroids, you know, when you took the first hit, you get these big blobs moving around the screen quite slowly. After the second hit, you know, you get these smaller blobs which are moving a bit faster. Uh, faster still as you break them down into tiny ones and by this stage they're whizzing all over the screen and if you actually take that approach in asteroids you're not going to live very long because these little fast ones are whizzing around the screen and you're going to get squished. So this would be equivalent to um, doing all your story, um, all your kind of story writing up front, just creating a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand uh, stories from a few kind of story um, writing workshops. And lots of teams do this, you know, start off with the, with this story writing and end up with hundreds and hundreds of, of tickets which just sit there and fester. Uh, and it can be overwhelming if, if that's what you do. So in Agile, you know, we're trying to hunt the value in a much more deliberate way. So after we've exploded the big asteroid, we want to then be really discerning about which one we choose next. You know, where's the diamond in there? Which one of these uh, asteroids contains the most value? And then we're still looking for it uh, as we blow it up and trying to leave bits behind as we go until the next asteroid looks a bit more interesting because there might be some more value lurking in there. Um, and so, you know, we might end up with some big chunks of stuff that never get delivered, which is probably a good thing, right? Because though something else more important is going to come up. And so this is like the, this all this complexity around, you know, this in and out of the problem in the solution space and, you know, needing to uh, break things down and needing to understand things at different levels of detail, but not always really deliberately knowing when that's happening. And hopefully uh, that's where Oopsie comes in. Um, so what are we trying to what are we trying to do with this? Well how's this how's Oopsie trying to fit that gap? So we're trying to find a balance between too much thinking and not enough. We're trying to understand the context, so focus on value. Um, we're trying to make sense of all these different iterations of, of, of analysis and synthesis. Ideally, we'd like a bit of structure uh, and also maybe some, some artifacts that support the right level of, de right level of detail um, for the team. Uh, so this is where Oops comes in. What is it? What is Oopsie? Is it agile analysis? Don't know. Is it agile testing? Is it user story splitting? Is it a living documentation structure? Is it a workshopping technique? Yes. 
So it's kind of all of those things. This is what I've come to realise since since I originally talked about it loads a few years ago. Is actually it can be super useful with all of the detail associated it if with it if you're a tester and you're working with BDD, but even if you're um, a product owner or even a product manager, you can get a lot of benefit from this uh, in the large or at, at sort of extrapolated level of detail. So let me tell you about it. Oopsie stands for outcomes, outputs, process, scenarios, inputs. And so we go down through starting with outcomes. So it's outside in. Um, and it's it's an acronym to remember whenever you're tackling a problem or tackling complexity or looking at a user story or starting a conversation about um, user needs. Um, it's a thing to keep in your head and see if you can step through these these uh, sections. So let's start with outcomes. Um, outcomes, obviously, really important. These relate to the impacts in the world that we're trying to make with our solutions, the way things turn out, a consequence. Um, we want to focus on that rather than deliverables, because that's that's how we know we're going to make a difference. And if we're an agile team, you know, we're going to be pursuing this outcome uh, to get the value as, as early as we can, get value to somebody and then try and optimise everything we do to get feedback so that we can get better at delivering value. Um, so we want to align our teams to outcomes. And sometimes one of the challenges with these little stories is that team members can, you know, they can know that as a as a car driver, I need a headlight to see the road ahead, but they might not know how that kind of lines up with the bigger picture. And so we want to help them see the bigger picture, right? But it's not just the car. It's not just these folks on, a, on an agile team having the same understanding of a vehicle, a red vehicle, right? We want to we want to make sure that we understand how that thing is going to deliver the value. And that can mean different things. So uh, we might be all thinking about a red vehicle, but, uh, you know, there might be value in a red vehicle for uh, an action family, being able to put all their clobber on the back of the car, go touring comfortably with a family of four, um, and have super holidays. That might be an awesome outcome. A different awesome outcome might be for a city worker to be able to drive emission free, park easily, have some low insurance, zip about town. Another outcome might be to be able to speed down uh, the autobahn and, and look really cool. You know, these are all different outcomes. And that's the thing that we want to make sure that we're exploring. Uh, so that um, we can make an impact. And one really important part of an autonomous team is that they understand the value and the purpose and um, the context of what they're working in. So if teams understand, you know, this kind of uh, level of alignment in terms of why they're doing what they're doing, then they're going to make they're going to make good decisions on a daily basis. So we want to try, we want our high performing autonomous teams to have this line of sight. So we want to spend time um, before we jump into solutioning, um, thinking about the outcomes and making sure we understand them. I love this, be a doctor. So I watched a, a talk from uh, Jeff Patton a few months ago now, um, where part of that talk he says, don't be a waiter, be a doctor. So we shouldn't be saying, um, you know, what can I get you? What's your list of requirements? We should be saying, tell me where it hurts. You know, tell me what your problems are. Um, and actually, if we think about doctors, they're measured by the outcomes of their patients, right? Not kind of the list of things that they prescribe. So that's the sort of headspace we want to be. Um, and so we want to fall in love with the problem, not the solution, and use whatever techniques we have at our disposal to help us um, be really clear about those outcomes. And so we, we think about storytelling. The thing about storytelling is that 
stories have a beginning, a middle and an end. So this is a typical kind of story structure. And at the beginning, you know, we're painting a picture of the villain and the problems that are experienced. And then in the middle, we're understanding the interactions between the problems and what could be better. And then, you know, as we get towards the end of the story, we sort of all rally towards the new hero. And when we get our customers and users to tell stories, properly tell stories, um, we can find that stuff out and we can be much more aligned to what they actually need and want. And so um, a few years ago, I went to this workshop called Comic Strip Story Mapping, um, which was run by a lady called Gemma Cameron, who's quite known on the Agile scene. And uh, we were challenged with, instead of writing a boring user story in user story format, trying to make it more like a, an actual story. So here's, here's something similar to what I did. It's not the actual one. but So Jenny really loves cheese. Oh, she's not feeling, feeling 100% today. Oh, what's this? An offer from Bad Mart. Oh, 12 low-fat yogurts for the price of 11. Not interested. Yogurt, really. Oh, Jenny's so hungry. Uh, another offer from Big Mart this time. Oh, free Cabernet Sauvignon when you spend £30 on the new artisan cheese range at Big Mart. Want that? Jenny rushes to Big Mart. Spends loads of money on things she doesn't need. Opens the wine. Big Mart offers. So awesome. Bring on the Netflix. That's what I'll be doing later. Um, more useful than this. As a customer, I need targeted digital coupons. So that I like Big Mart the best. And so, you know, with this outcome step, it's all about encouraging our teams to use whatever means uh, helps us understand the outcomes that we're trying to achieve the best and not be like a template zombie. As a user, I need a system in order to use the system. And so we know that that parlance is there to help us think about the user and help, help us think about the value. But if you're in a room on your own writing stories to fit this format, <clears throat> we've kind of missed, missed the point of what we were trying to do. So we want our teams to focus on AUKUS or awesome outcomes and we're looking for the most important ones. That's the start of Oopsie. So the second part of Oopsie is outputs. And these are interesting. Um, so Part of systems thinking, which has been around since like the 1930s, 1940s, which is a whole kind of whole body of research around systems in nature and science and engineering and, you know, everything. And there's um, some rules that have kind of come out of that big body of research, which is still kind of influences a lot of our working practices today. And one of them is that a system may be evaluated by determining if its output results in the achievement of its objective. So what, what do we mean by that? Um, well, we simply mean outputs are important. And if you're, if you're a, a, a tester, we're talking about the thens, right? So you already know this, you already know that your expected results, your thens are the important part. And as I keep talking about, you know, we are, we need to hunt that value. We need ways of uh, blowing up that asteroid and knowing which one to go for next. And so um, we want to look for the really important outputs. If we do that, it might help us know where to start when we're thinking about, you know, doing some more analysis. Um, and so we see output related things all the time. They're sort of disguised. In order to, to do my personal accounts and know I've been paid, as an employee, I need a pay slip, right? So this is an output -y type thing. Might be part of a huge ERP project that includes, um, you know, payroll stuff and um, other kind of downstream reporting and 
all sorts of plug on bits of HR software. It could be absolutely huge, which makes it really difficult to get started. So if we, if we think about the outputs and if we look at them in a really specific way, we can start to cut off a slice, right? So for example, an, that, an output is a payslip. We might draw it, we might talk about it, get people together and say, do we understand what we mean by a payslip? What's the most important output um, from this ERP process in the first place? Well, a payslip and getting paid, they're two pretty important outputs. And we might go a bit further, we might say, okay, well, let's, get, let's have an example of a payslip. Um, do we mean one like this? Or could we could we start with something more simple where there's no overtime, um, where there's no commission, uh, where there's no student loan or union fees, where it's a UK employee? How about we start with this payslip and illustrate it in a really concrete way? And then what would that look like? How would that relate to the bank account of that person? How much would they have been paid and how would that be tracked? in the downstream internal reporting. And so when you look for outputs in a really specific way and you, and you, you collaborate on hunting the most important ones first, then you can suddenly get this laser focus, which helps you get started. And as you'll see when I go through an example, um, our outputs often define our kind of first iteration of our data model. So we wanna bring people into these conversations and draw this stuff and, you know, illustrate it with, with real data. So outputs is the second step. Start with the most important outcomes, then try and have discussions about the most important outputs that uh, are valuable in order to achieve the outcomes that we've, we've examined. And then we get to process. Um, and so I don't think it's just, it's certainly not just Oopsie that includes this step. I think that in the years after Agile kind of came in in the 2010s, there were lots of teams all over the place finding their own patterns of working that help bring some process into what they're doing. Um, because there's a, a, a huge value in, in seeing the narrative and being able to collaborate around the steps and the interactions that need to happen in order to achieve the outcome that you're looking for. So there's loads of other techniques that include this story mapping, um, you may have heard or recommend. Um, event storming, brilliant collaborative practice for, you know, mapping out how we expect our, how our systems are working. Value stream mapping, and it, you know, is also using process. If you're trying to, if you're trying to look at your, the way you're working and unblock um, parts of, of the process. User journey mapping in the large, you know, these are all useful visualizations of uh, the narrative. And this gives a lot of context to help align everybody. Um, and this is a really natural thing that we did in our team where this all kicked off with Chris and Pete. You know, we would, we would always start by unpacking, unpacking whatever it was by looking at the steps involved. Uh, the difference between process kind of in, in this capacity versus in the before time when we did all that upfront stuff is that if you've slimmed down the outputs, um, before you start thinking about the process, you get a linear, much more linear process. So in the before time, um, you know, if we were thinking about that big ERP implementation, you'd probably have at least nine pages of paper sellotape together with loads of decision trees. And like, if you're a UK employee, you get this pay slip. And if you're, uh, if you're abroad, you get this one. And if you've got student loan, this, this happens. And if you know, so if you strip down the outputs, you end up with something linear, which means that you can get started and start collaborating around that process without without having to do that, which is super useful. And often I find that teams are missing that. They're missing anything in their software development process that helps them collaborate around the narrative. And of course, we know stories are good, right? Um, the original intention of them was about how they should be used. And so uh, it's really important for us to understand the narrative. Uh, if we think about um, splitting user stories up, we want to have some kind of narrative where we can tell a story that doesn't sort of separate the different components from our system, because that's the way that um, we know that we've got something valuable there. So loads of teams struggle with this. How do we break down 
what we've got to do, find something valuable and meaningful, but slim. And so um, with these two steps, output some process, you've taken a big step on your way there by finding uh, somewhere to start that still tells a story. So outcomes, then look for the important outputs and then capture the process which uh, the interactions, the navigation, which deliver those specific outputs that you've collaborated on. And you've got a nice simple process comes out of that. And then, and only then, start thinking about scenarios and what you're trying to test. So what I see um, a lot of is that a leap from, from kind of either no real context into story writing, or even worse, straight into given when thens. Um, and there's just hundreds of them. They're, they're impossible to, um, to, to digest and to make sense of if you leap in. But if you wait until you have a process that you can visualize and um, uh, discuss and collaborate on, the scenarios are much easier then to consider because they relate to the process and you, you end up with this nice structure. Um, which helps you uh, know where to start and it helps you organise all of those other um, artefacts which are going to start to um, support your um, articulating what the what the specification is going to be. And so we're here we're talking about, you know, acceptance criteria and stuff that is enduring, um, which is going to be useful to keep. And then finally, inputs. So this is where all of the deep test practices come in. Um, I'm not going to go too much into this. If you have a testing background, you know exactly what equivalence partitioning is and boundary value analysis and all of that stuff. Um, but of course, when we're thinking about scenarios, we're only going to really be confident once we've thrown lots of data um, at those scenarios. And we that by data, I mean preconditions, which are the setup of a test and all of the different inputs that you could have that could lead to different expected results. And there's great techniques like specification by example that help us um, come up with the leanest set of tests, really concrete examples that help us validate um, our system behaviour. And what Oopsie has um, really shown me is that actually if you come in at it through Oopsie before you get to thinking about tests and inputs, you already have a really nice structure that helps you join up techniques like specification by example with um, and be other BDD practices, using, you know, using given when then and tables of data and stuff, structure them around something which makes sense. OK, so I'm not going to go too much into this because it will take me too long. OK, so um, I have some examples of this, but um, I think I'm going to save them. Um, for uh, that they're, they're in this deck, I will quickly talk to you about Oopsie Mapping because I want to get the conversation going. So when we talk about actually doing this collaboratively as a technique, you know, you start with the outcomes It might be a user story. It might be a comic strip story. It might be a picture. It might be. If you've ever done impact mapping, it might be a how node on an impact map. It could come in from all different directions. So you're going to spend time thinking about what do we mean by that? Do we understand the problems that we're solving? You know, are there other ways that we can explore this value? Can we visualize the value we're creating? Uh, and then thinking about the outputs. What are the most important outputs that deliver the value? Can we illustrate them? Can we make them really concrete? before deciding where to start. And this information helps us define our data model. Once we've decided on um, the outputs, uh, then we can think about, well, which process, which kind of linear process helps us generate that output? Uh, and we want to use storytelling to help the whole team understand the context and narrative. Once we've then got the process, we can start brainstorming scenarios. 
And these are different paths through the process. Uh, but we're thinking of when we're thinking about tests, they tend to hang off these blue activity boxes, which I hope I'll get to show you very quickly. And then for each of those scenarios, we, we want to collaborate around the data that drives them because we know that that's where loads of potential for misunderstanding sits. So those are the in inputs and preconditions that drive the scenarios and we want to collaborate on those. We don't want to leave it till the end because we know that um, a real challenge in terms of getting confident about a system is being able to come up with the, the right data to test it. And so if we collaborate around that, then um, we've got a much better chance of, of reducing the rework that we're trying to do. OK, right, zoom through an example here. I know I'm running out of time. So back to the coupon space. As a retailer, I want to issue coupons so that I can engage customers and increase sales. What do we think the outputs are for this scenario? They are coupons. 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 Thanks, Pete. Coupons. And so we might start by just describing the different sorts of outputs that are important and illustrating them. And in this case, we've got a variety. You know, one of them is quite simple. It's just money off, uh, money off your next shop if you if you buy things that meet a certain criteria. The next one, the, the garden centre one's a bit more complicated. It's about when you present your big club card. Um, I'm going from the right hand side to the left just to be confusing. The, uh, the QR code one, you know, that might be related to an app. Um, something driven by some data segmentation and, and a push notification or even a text message. And we might be able to talk to the customer and say, OK, these are all the different things you want to be able to do. Um, what else? Oh, some reports. That's another useful output. And we might be able to say, which is the important one? If we were to just deliver this functionality around the rustic wrap, would that be useful? Could you get some value from that? And they might say yes. And so, OK, well, if we show that on a report as well, show show how how coupons get issued and how they get um, how they get what they look like. And if we if we produce this, will you be happy? And then from there, we can think about the the process. And in this case, you don't need to know this, right? But we're going to scan a basket, evaluate it, print the coupon, log the data and view the report. And then we're going to start thinking about, OK, scenarios. But before we do that, we might think about the process a little bit and think, well, where are the important parts of this process? So in our case, we weren't changing anything on the printer. We weren't changing anything on a scanner. Our code was going to sit on the till and respond to the, the basket being scanned. Um, so we decided to hone in on evaluate basket. Now, if we hadn't done that, there'd be loads of different scenarios, right? Qualifying baskets, what if the basket doesn't scan? What if there's no paper in the printer? What if there's network errors? And on and on and on and on and on. But if we um, decided to um, go for the most important one, which in our case was evaluate basket, and what you'll notice is all of those scenarios resolve around one of those um, steps in the process, then we can start thinking about um, using other techniques like specification by example, BDD stuff to make that really clear. So given a rustic wraps promotion was set up on the till, when a rustic wraps qualifying basket is evaluated, then the coupon will be printed and the issuance will be logged and the report will be available. Uh, and these turn into nice specification by example examples which we can increment by looking at some examples which support a qualifying basket and then some that support a non-qualifying basket um wrong thing in the basket offer expired wrong time of day wrong day of week so i'm not going to go into this in too much detail if you want to ping me 
if you're interested in more detail, I do have some Miro boards, which I've got lots of different examples which you can use, which I'm happy to share. So I can get that to you. But if you're interested in specification by example and BDD, then you can see how um, this is a really good target for development and we've come in at it really quite quickly. And then if we were to loop back, uh, having delivered that, we might see what's the next output. This one, um, 10 pounds off Big Mark Garden Centre. The process has changed. Now we've got this thing called scan loyalty card, which wasn't there before. And so we can start to think about um, the scenarios to support that around evaluate basket. I'll step these through slowly so that you can look at them on the video when when it's done. And uh, and then you'd have some new scenarios around scan multi card. So you can see how they're already kind of structured to support those different steps in the process. And if you were using other techniques like BDD, one of the challenges is rationalizing your tests so that they're there's no duplication so that their um, responsibility is contained to the thing they're trying to test. And so what I found is that if you actually brainstorm the process first, you save yourself a lot of pain uh, in terms of making that nice and lean. And so you might have a set, another set of example to support the cards. And then when you came to the this one, this um, app, it's a completely different process. This is now involving identifying customer segments and um, push offers and all sorts of things, which is completely different. And so you can see how, how by looking at the outputs separately, you can uh, kind of defer pain and complexity until later and still get some, some value from it. I've got another example here, which uh, I'm not going to talk through because I didn't think we'd have time. It's about a bank example, uh, capturing uh, some important outputs. Um, you know, what happens when you resolve those different scenarios around different steps in the process? What you tend to get is like a, an aggregate of, of interest, which you want to explore in more detail with some scenarios. And as I said, this this example is worked up in detail uh, on my Miro board that I've got. Um, this page just shows how if, if you don't um, come in via the particular activity boxes, you end up with lots of duplication. Um, and so if you were following good practice in terms of testing, you would uh, want to be eliminating um, lots of permutations of, of repetition. And so when you come in uh, with just looking around the specific example of check account balance, you've sort of automatically rationalised back to this, which is what I'm trying to demonstrate. So that's Oopsie. Uh, normally, um, this is covered in, in one of my courses, Continuous Collaboration, which spends like a whole day going into this. Um, so I'd really encourage you to give it a try. Another interesting thing about it is that this, these layers of Oopsie uh, kind of help with structure. So, you know, outcomes are particularly interesting right at the top of the, of the pyramid. You know, as we move through and we're talking about process scenarios, we can see there's a relationship back to that sort of V model structure that we talked at the beginning. So it's really helping you um, have a structure and sort of a bit more um, understanding of where you are in the process as you do your analysis. And it's, I'd like it to be thought of as a toolbox, um, not just that detailed testing stuff, which which testers and BDD interested people might get lots of value out of. But for anybody, you know, if you're if you're trying to um, prioritize and break down something big, you know, having oopsie in your head is going to help you uh, navigate towards that value. Um, you know, as a 
as testers, it's going to help you structure your tests, but also get them ready for automation if that's something you're doing. Um, product owners, the whole team. Uh, it's, it's a useful way if you're collaborating using Oopsie to get everybody to develop this nice shared understanding. Um, this is about as happy as this guy gets here. Uh, helps helps your engineers and designers start small by kind of growing a small um, data model from from the from the earliest outputs that are required. And really, for anybody to help uh, unpack complex problems in a structured and value focused way. So I see it as a toolkit for the whole team. And that is me. Questions? I'm going to stop presenting. Hello. Can see you all again now. Have I stopped presenting? Uh, you have, Jenny. Yes. Okay. Oh, it's so good to see all that again. <laughs> Do you know? It's what's amazing is that so little has changed in like eight years you'd have thought that um that people would have been overcoming these problems right but they're they're not they're still they're still happening still out there um absolutely i think i mean i've, I've taken so much of this forwards the i mean the really big bit for me is is examples everywhere yep. and so where you were talking about specification by example and how this way of thinking can take you straight to the interesting scenarios that you need the examples for. Um, but yeah, I still find it a big struggle to get teams uh, thinking in terms of examples rather than rules, but it's it, it's such a, a big leap in improvement when you can do that. Yeah, I didn't mean to go so close to the time. There's so much in there. Are there, is there any time for questions, Jerome? Can people stay on or will the meeting end? Uh, no, people can stay on. It's yeah. seven in the evening. No. All right. So, so can, no, we're not going to get ugh, cut off like, yeah, because it says there's five minutes left in the meeting. That won't. No, no, no. It's not, no, people can stay on. Not an issue at all. So anybody have any questions or, or any feedback? I mean, I think um, from my end, because um, I, I work with embedded products, so essentially you're developing the hardware as well as the software on top of it. So it's quite tricky to sort of try and get a kind of um, get it to work in a kind of a true agile sense. Because yeah. yeah, it's it I'm I'm sort of trying to look for ways to try and make it a bit more agile uh, and also uh, to sort of um, involve more testing throughout all the different stages and the development phases. So it's it's quite tricky to sort of try and uh sort of um uh to write user stories because you have to have everything up front because you can't change the hardware yeah. as, as 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 you go through so it, it's quite interesting uh, to see how i can apply that in that yeah. situation and actually with, with if you do this oopsie you don't need stories at all you don't you, you if you if you uh if you had if you had a way of capturing everything all of the collaboration at those different points to visualize the outcomes and understand the navigation and the outputs you actually don't you don't need stories what becomes really important is the example that Pete was talking about that actually specifies behavior in a certain set of circumstances um and so that's quite an interesting that's quite an interesting thing as well of course if you if you use stories you can still apply the same thinking and get and get to the same place but you can do it in, in a more stealthy way without even having them in the first place but don't tell anybody i said that i mean i think the the other thing is uh, when you're kind of working in a regulated environment uh, you've got these uh, regulatory uh, sort of uh, requirements that you need to bring into into yeah. your um, agile process as well so that's uh, that's another thing that i'm sort of trying yeah uh, trying to get get working within um, jira and x-ray yeah and one of the things I think with that is, so that comes up quite a lot, doesn't it? Teams talk about, they get really kind of um, talking about MVP and, you know, what's the smallest thing we can do? And it can be so hard in lots of environments to actually put something live without 
it being like 90% complete, right? So the challenge then is to stop thinking about MVP in terms of the smallest thing we can put live or the smallest thing we can sell, but start thinking about it as uh, what can we do that helps bring forward the learning process? And so that could be wholly in your development environment. You know, how do we, what's our strategy for building this thing that brings forward learning and gives us as many opportunities for feedback as we can? Like, what's the smallest thing we can do that tests out our assumptions? And when you think about it like that, it's a much more accessible concept. Thank you. I have a friend who is very non-technical. He's a high level VAT lawyer and he struggles to understand um, IT concepts. So over a coffee, I suggested, well, if you think about it from what it is you're trying to achieve and work backwards, then you have a much greater chance of success. So if you, for example, want to start with an invoice, you can create a program that will simply print everything that's hard coded in your invoice so you get the layout right. Then you can put a variable in that says what's the total to be printed and then the subtotal, how's that calculated? And then you work backwards and work backwards and work backwards. And talking about getting the value, the value is, well, we know we can print an invoice. So now all we have to do, air quotes, is to work out how we calculate the things to go on to the invoice. Yeah. And so sometimes taking um, taking that outcomes first analysis approach and looking at the outputs from that can actually really turn on a, um, a previously sceptical um end user into the process because all of a sudden they see how they can help work with the process and they don't have to be bamboozled as it were by all of these technical people whose domains they don't understand so it can really bring um product users into the process in a really early way and start chasing down okay if we could deliver that in an hour and then we could deliver the next bit in another 10 minutes and so on and so on and so on and then as you say it starts to open up the questions such as okay this invoice has got this many hours for that sort of work done by that sort of person at that sort of rate but you don't need to design a database and an input mechanism to provide all of those data at the front all yeah. you need is an invoice that you can mimic and then work your way yeah. backwards through that. And that's exactly it. So if, if you if you use a sort of oopsie approach in that, you very quickly figure out, OK, which step of this interaction is the important but is the important bit is this calculation here. OK, so let's let's in, in a couple of weeks, let's see if we can demonstrate this calculation being figured out and showing on that invoice. Exactly. It's exactly that, that kind of navigating your way in to find the first valuable thing to start with. Any other thoughts? Ian, you look like you're going to say something. I don't know if you are. <laughs> Do you know what it is? I typed it. I was about to go, but then I was just going to wait and see if anyone was trying. <laughs> Uh, so I just want to, it's not really a question it's just that it's really interesting I just want to say it's really interesting and I thought you presented it really well you know very very clear and uh, the examples were very well set out so um, I'd love to see your mirror board thanks Ian yeah I've got and I wish I'd had time to step through see the thing is I've I've done this so many times this kind of through those examples and when I get into them I start boring myself because I've done it before so I end up like whizzing yeah. through uh, but yeah, I do have a lot more detail with a few different worked examples. So you'll see if, how we can try and uh, get share those with, with everyone on the call. Yeah, I was wondering though, does it get kind of complex? Uh, the examples you set out were quite simple ones with different types of coupons. But if, when you start having like uh, more variables and different, more complex logic, does, does that cause 
difficulties with the system. So the complex logic ones are actually quite nice because that's when the value of of collaborating around that data and using the techniques like specification by example become really powerful when you find those bits of the of the navigate of the narrative that have that complexity and richness yeah. of inputs and outputs that can be really nice. Um, it's always it's always uh, different in different senses. So some some things have very little of that, and actually there's you know you're stepping through a process with very little variation from thing to thing. I think what Oopsie helps you with is having the conversations and knowing where to start so that you can start to have conversations with the team about where the complexity lies, where the risk is, where the assumptions are. And you can say together, actually, yeah, we've got this interaction, but we know how to do all of this stuff. We know how to do all of that stuff, all of that stuff. It's only when we get to this bit yeah. that we're we're developing something new. So let's let's not even write anything about any of the other stuff because we know it already. Let's just dive in and examine this and try and make it concrete and see if we can get something working end to end. Would you say like user story mapping is is the main sort of backbone and inspiration behind it, with kind of other interesting bits talking tailing it? Well, a little bit, but but you the difference with user story mapping in most teams that I've seen using it, and also as described by um, Jeff, is that it seems to be um, more like a, a backwards thing where you've got all of these stories and then you're going to try and arrange them into some sort of narrative and then from there try and figure out your release slices. Yeah. Yeah. So you've already brainstormed all of those yeah. You've already brainstormed yeah. stories. I think it's it depends how you do it. I mean, like, I think Jeff talks about you start with like really broad, yeah, and yeah. Start then you know pick a pick a scenario or an outcome and then start to fill out that one and and then start to draw your thing. But I totally relate to what you're saying about having just a, a huge ocean of stories that don't really have the context around them. Yeah. And it's almost like you're wasting time writing lots of detailed stuff that is kind of out of context and might not actually be prioritised. Yeah, but it is the same pattern, you know, so I think it's the same thing, seeking an understanding of the narrative. And actually, the thing about Oopsie is I don't want it to be prescriptive at all. It's so so it might be that it might be that when you're doing process stuff, you're doing story mapping or you're doing event storming, or you might be sort of in the large with a big customer journey map, you know, and but even with a customer journey map, so I've, I've facilitated some big customer journey workshops, even if you're doing that in the large, it's useful to say, what are the important outputs from this yeah. process before you start to understand the, the user problems and stuff? So, yeah. Um, so yeah, it can be anything at that process stage, which, which includes some sort of visualization of the narrative. Yeah, I found it really interesting that you're saying outcomes and outputs, because you often hear um, like, a product purists talking about um, outcomes over outputs, but you've actually, actually you need both, This was a, I thought was really interesting with your uh, oopsie. Yeah, and I think it is out outcomes over outputs, right? Because outcomes yeah. comes first. Yeah. But then by looking for the outputs, you find a way in. And so in, in Chris Matt's feature injection stuff, which is kind of over 10 years old now, I think, and he's talking about, um, given when then type stuff and he says start with the thens and so that's the kind of out yeah. outside yep. in and it's similar to that you know it's a similar it's a similar thing start first with what you're trying to produce because normally there's value in that for somebody any other thoughts you're very smiley marie No, I think I know, <clears throat> of course, quite well the presentation we work together. So, and it's amazing to 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 see it in practice really out to the team. So I really encourage you. If you're curious, the Miro board is amazing. So definitely is something to, to see. And uh, I think in, uh, it helps a lot of teams and uh, might be no perfection, but uh, introducing that technique it really helps. Yeah, I, th I think it was useful as well uh, to sort of try and bring out the detail uh, from uh, uh, just, you know, the, the, the fact that you've got your uh, outputs, I um, can't remember what the other ones were, <laughs> uh, you've got the process, um, and then you've got the, um, 
Uh, oh, oh, was it oopsie? <laughs> yeah, so this is, feels like a test. What's next? What's next? Yeah, and it's the scenario. It's just yeah, so yeah, that's just really saying true. that's just saying don't start trying to brainstorm tests until you've visualized the narrative. Because the narrative and the process gives you a, an inherent structure to how your tests might pop out. And it also helps you start in the right place. And I also think that being a template zombie is not a good idea as well. <laughs> so I think uh, we've all done that. Yeah, there's a lot of it about there's a lot of um there's a lot of teams kind of desperately trying to get good at doing Scrum or whatever it is they're doing and, and not focusing so much on how valuable the work is that they're doing. Jay, what was the thing you called it? Uh, was it template zombies? Yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love that. Yeah, it's not mine. I, that's not <laughs> mine. But I loved it as well when I saw it. I did a little, did a little Yelp. <laughs> Jenny, um, great talk, thank you. Um, I wonder if, are you familiar with outside in development? Um, if you are, would you say that Oopsie is kind of like taking outside in development, extending it up so that it's it's doing it like at an even higher level than where you write the UI test, where you write the shell of UI and like move down, yes, like I everything so. above that? I think so, now I'm not a developer. They tried to turn me into a developer <laughs> for all systems and it didn't work. Um, but yes, Chris Matt's feature injection is about that. It, it my, that's my understanding is that it, it is it is coming from that place. I don't know if Jerome or or Pete, if he's still, I think had to, Pete had to dodge, but anybody else got any thoughts on that? But yeah, it's very much. Sorry, go on, Jerome. Yeah, sorry, it, it is. It is like, uh, you know, it's really collaborating at a very high level. And, uh, you know, you basically do oopsie you know even before you start anything uh, and then from that you can extend to outside in and all that but it is it is a very very first step that you do uh before before you start any process it's, it's kind of interesting to me that it, it's similar to outside in it's been around a long time and it's a real struggle to get developers to do it because it flips everything on the, on its head and kind of it's counterintuitive to do things backward but interestingly com uh bdd and forget about bdd oopsie is actually i found it fairly easy to roll out in agile projects because agile by nature should be collaborative so if you if you talk about collaboration and bring a process around it generally people buy into it um, and because it's all driven by all the stakeholders mainly by the scrum masters usually it gets rolled out pretty you know nicely and you know, it gets followed uh, by the team. Really? Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. like that, I feel, I feel the problem we have with TDD and with like outside in isn't so much that like it's collaboration. It's just people expect to start with say the inputs first and then move from there. Yeah. And it's like rock solid in their head and like trying to flip that on its head and trying to get them to think yeah. about things in a different way. That's the really hard bit. Yeah, that, that's exactly the reason why outside in a TDD is difficult is, is for the developers to change their mind, you know, as you rightly said, to flip their mind. But with Oopsie, because the first step that you do as a team is to follow Oopsie and derive scenarios, there is no flipping from a developer's perspective. It's just the team's culture as a collaboration. You do Oopsie and then you start the development or any other work, you know, kind of uh, works really well. Okay. Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, thanks so much, Johnny. It's been a pleasure. I know I've been practicing OC, but I've learned so much in this call. Um, we might have to run this again. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been, no, no, it's really, really good. Thank you so much. A uh, few things before we wrap up. Uh, if you have any experience in BDD or Agile collaboration, or if you want to share anything with the community, just give me a shout. I would be thrilled to showcase your you know, insights. Um, I'll also be posting this recording in LinkedIn, so please watch out. I'm sure Jenny will share as well. Um, 
So please watch out in LinkedIn. I, do, I we don't capture any of your emails, so I can't send an email, but I will be posting it in LinkedIn. And one final um, shameless sales pitch. Um, I want to introduce you to No Code BDD. I'm the founder of No Code BDD. So using No Code BDD, the scenarios that you derive, of course, using Oopsie, um, you know, you can execute them in few clicks. Uh, if you are interested, just drop me an email or go to our website, No Code BDD, and download a free version. Um, that's all from me, Jenny. Uh, anything else from you? No, just thanks for thanks for turning up and listening. And really nice to see your lovely smiley faces. That always helps me keep going with the talking into the abyss. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and um, yeah, please reach out if you'd like to know anything more because that there's I've got so much more material that I could could help if you're interested. Thank you, thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. Have a great evening. Thank Bye. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thanks. You stop recording. Uh, yeah, I'm going to record. Stop recording. This.